Hi there. I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more conversations. Our subject today is China, COVID, trade, human rights, China's place in the world. With us is an authority on Chinese affairs. She is Elizabeth Economy, senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. She is the author of a brilliant book entitled The Third Revolution, Xi Jinping and the New Chinese State. We're pleased to welcome Liz Economy back to the program. Liz, delighted to see you, delighted to have you with us. And uh, let's start with uh, the grisly subject of COVID. They say the curve is flattened in China and with the statistics that have come out, they say they have 11 new cases every day. We have 60,000. Uh, they have uh, 91,000 uh, since it began. Uh, 4,739 deaths. We have 8 million since it began and 224,000 deaths. Uh, what accounts for this dramatic disparity? Um, well, first, Jim, thanks. It's great to, to be back with you. Um, and I think appropriate to be talking about this uh, topic uh, as we are still in the midst of this uh, pandemic. Uh, so what accounts for this difference is, is really, uh, you know, in large part, our own administration, the Trump administration, uh, which has uh, been an abject failure in terms of uh, addressing the pandemic. Uh, and so I think it would be a mistake as many commentators uh, have done or many analysts have done uh, to assume that because China has done a very effective job of uh, arresting uh, the pandemic, uh, that somehow this is a tribute to their authoritarian system and that somehow democracies are not as able to address it just because the United States has not done a good job because many democracies have in fact done a very good job uh, of uh, fighting back against the uh, COVID-19. Uh, so Taiwan uh, is an exemplar, uh, South Korea, Germany, New Zealand. Uh, there are many cases uh, you know, of states uh, that have managed uh, to educate their populace, uh, to undertake the appropriate uh, measures uh, and to stop this virus uh, you know, almost as soon as it, as it, as it hit. Uh, so I, I know that uh, there is this sense somehow that we should be comparing the United States and China as system types and that we should draw some you know, significant lessons, uh, but I don't think that that's the case. I think the United States has been, um, you know, not uniquely, but certainly very terribly at the bottom of the pile uh, in terms of addressing this. Well, at the beginning of the uh, pandemic, uh, Trump was full of praise for Xi and said he'd handle the thing marvelously and applauded his transparency. And then something happened. Now it's the China virus and it's really China that was responsible for giving it to us in the first place. I mean, what accounts for the change? Is this legitimate uh, or is this just posturing? So, I mean, certainly, you know, the virus originated in China and, you know, within the first several weeks, uh, even really the first month uh, of the spread within China, uh, there is an argument, and I think a valid one to be made, that uh, had the uh, Chinese government been more transparent, you know, it, had they not had this culture of fear, you know, not uh, clamp down on the doctors who tried to warn uh, the people uh, initially uh, about the virus, that in fact, uh, they could have, uh, alerted the international community much earlier than they did, uh, and that this allowed for the spread of the virus outside the country. So I, I do think that there is, is some truth to uh, the accusation that had Ch China managed it better at the outset, that uh, parts of the world would not have confronted it at all, perhaps. Uh, but that does not, you know, in any way uh, address the issue of how we handled it once the virus had spread here. And I think the president is simply looking for uh, someone to blame, uh, again, for what has been an abject failure on the part of the administration. Um, and, you know, calling it the China virus and the, this kind of rhetorical, you know, hype, it doesn't do anybody any good. What we should be doing is focusing on what we need to do to address it and, and to arrest it. What about the vaccine? Uh, in uh, the city of Zhejiang, China has uh, begun, even as we speak, to distribute uh, the vaccine on a trial basis, uh, we hear that it's going to be a long time before uh, there's a distributable vaccine here in the United States uh, sometime in 2021, if then. Uh, is that evidence that uh, their system is more efficient? Well, I, I think 
probably, um, you know, look, certainly China has made great strides um, in, you know, pharmaceuticals and research and development. Um, but I think what we're looking at in this case is the fact that the United States simply has much more stringent uh, rules and regulations uh, for the approval process of new vaccines and new treatments than China does. Uh, and, you know, frankly speaking, this is an area where I would be uh, much more inclined uh, to trust what would come out of the United States and what would come out of China, uh, if only because the history of China with regard uh, to things like product safety, food safety, is not a very good one. Uh, and so I would prefer to see China take relatively more rather than less time uh, in terms of its trials and testing and, and having something that was uh, proven to work uh, as opposed to trying to rush through uh, some new vaccine that uh, may or may not actually either uh, address the issue or may have longer term side effects that they simply didn't take the time to ascertain. Uh, so I don't know that it's, uh, you know, the Chinese somehow just doing a better job of, of getting at a vaccine as much as it is that they just have a much shorter time for their, uh, you know, testing and approval process. Will COVID at all affect China's foreign policy? Well, I think we've seen already um, the, <laughs> some of the ways in which it's affected its foreign policy. And, uh, you know, one of the things that's come out of, of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, I think, has been uh, a, a new awareness, you know, frankly speaking, of, of the sort of bullying and authoritarian nature uh, of Chinese diplomats and foreign policy. Uh, I'm sure you've heard the term wolf warrior diplomacy, uh, mm -hmm. you know, which uh, refers uh, to, you know, a couple of movies that came out, you know, which uh, Chinese, you know, elite forces, you know, rescue people away from the terrible American and other mercenaries. Uh, but basically these diplomats, uh, you know, went out, have, have fanned out across the, the world uh, spreading disinformation, you know, threatening countries, uh, you know, with withholding um, sort of the medical supplies that China had available to sell and to donate if, if they didn't publicly thank China for the assistance, uh, or, you know, when Australia uh, said that it wanted to do, wanted to see an investigation into the origins of the virus, because we still haven't actually ascertained precisely where this virus, you know, originated from. Uh, you know, the Chinese stopped uh, uh, buying um, beef and put tariffs on their barley and uh, have continued with a range of other economic sanctions. So this kind of threatening and bullying behavior, I think, uh, really, um, you know, was to the detriment uh, of China. And beyond that, of course, we saw very aggressive action out of China in the South China Sea, right in the midst of the pandemic. I mean, at the very height of the pandemic, it's actually pretty shocking. Uh, you know, China's out there sinking uh, a Vietnamese fishing boat, you know, undertaking pretty aggressive action uh, in uh, territorial waters around Malaysia and Indonesia, passing the Hong Kong uh, National Security Act, which basically now has transformed Hong Kong, you know, just into another Chinese city, just to completely um, crack down on Hong Kong's uh, political and civil rights. Uh, so all of this aggressive action and this threatening rhetoric, I think, um, really uh, basically made um, the Chinese uh, diplomats, what should have been a diplomatic win for China, turn into really a diplomatic debacle. Let's turn to trade. Uh, for um, um, some period of time, Trump tried to make a, uh, a deal with China. He thought uh, he was on the verge of a trade deal. Uh, and then something happened. And now we're in the midst of uh, a trade war. Negotiation has uh, morphed into confrontation. Uh, how uh, would you characterize our current relationship? I think um, in the pretty much 25 years that I've been studying China, I have not seen uh, the relationship uh, at such a low point. Uh, we essentially have no uh, diplomatic engagement with China uh, at this point, our bilateral framework that we had developed uh, just to talk to the Chinese, to talk to Chinese officials uh, has atrophied. Uh, and certainly you're right. I mean, right at the, uh, right when COVID hit, uh, we had just signed uh, the phase one trade deal. Um, and, you know, I think we're somewhat hopeful, some people were somewhat hopeful that there might be a phase two. Uh, but it, it's unlikely that the Chinese will completely fulfill phase one, which in essence was just buying more American goods in order to redress the bilateral trade deficit, which was really 
President Trump's biggest you know, concern in the entire relationship with China, and one that economists felt was not the right way to uh, even look at the issue, look at the problem. Uh, phase two is supposed to deal with the actual issues and problems in the US-China trade relationship. Uh, you know, and that's the intellectual property theft and the subsidies and the state directed nature and the market uh, barriers to entry for American firms. So all of those issues, which actually are important and need to be addressed, are, are clearly not uh, going to be addressed. And there's you know, essentially no hope at this point that we're going to move forward with real trade negotiations uh, for a phase two trade deal. Um, so what happened to COVID-19 certainly interrupted things. Um, but beyond that, it's just that the really truly hard work of negotiating the trade deal, I think, was something that President Trump, uh, even, if, even if the Ambassador Lighthizer had the patience for it, I don't think President Trump did. Uh, well, Kevin Rudd, the former Australian prime minister, says that we're in the middle of an economic cold war with China. Would you agree with that? I mean, I think it goes beyond uh, an economic cold war. I think I think the danger is that you know we're on a precipice of a of a real cold war, um, and one that engages uh, not just a sort of bifurcation um, of of you know the, the world into sort of two different uh, tech technological, national security, and economic spheres. Um, but also there's, a, there's an ideological component to this, which I think you know, is still under debate here in the United States about whether this is, is happening. But from my perspective, uh, China certainly is exporting elements of authoritarianism uh, around the world, uh, parts of its system, uh, in ways that are reinforcing uh, authoritarian systems in other countries. and. Uh, providing them with the technological tools, doing political training for officials on how to control civil society, how to monitor the internet, all of the things that China does at home, uh, it's you know, exporting abroad. And so I am quite concerned, uh, actually, that when you look across issues like technology you know, and the decoupling process that seems to be underway, uh, when you look at you know, the economic issues now with the entities lists and uh, you know, new investment screening uh, that's going on in both countries, uh, and, and parts of the rest of the world um, that in fact, and certainly the security confrontation, especially in, in uh, around Taiwan and the South China Sea, um, and the fact that we don't have any real framework for discussion and negotiation, uh, I think we are in a very, um, at a very dangerous moment in the relationship. Well, we've moved uh, aircraft carriers. The Cold War could become a hot war. We've moved aircraft carriers into the South China Sea. And then, uh, so we've, probably embarked on a um, policy of confrontation with China. Uh, when you couple that with uh, uh, blocking China tech companies from doing business in the United States, or uh, as we started to do with TikTok and, and, uh, and WeChat, uh, we just seem to be going on a slippery slope to uh, um, a serious uh, confrontation with uh, uh, the world's uh, uh, largest emerging economy. Yeah, I think, um, I think you're right. Uh, I think that the, the challenge really is that the administration is not wrong in many respects to look across um, the full scope of the U.S.-China relationship and to identify areas where perhaps um, you know, China has taken advantage of the United States or where China is posing new kinds of challenges that we hadn't seen previously. Uh, I think there is a recognition that China under Xi Jinping is a fundamentally different uh, country than it was in the pre-Xi era, that, that the ambition is much greater and that, that Xi's China does pose new kinds of challenges to the United States that need to be addressed. So I think in the, in the sense that the administration has undertaken a reset of, of China policy, sort of rethought it and reset it, that's important. I think where we're missing the boat in a, in a dangerous way, as you suggest, is that it's not clear that the administration has a sense for what is the end of objective? What is it when the administration looks out five or 10 years from now, what do they want to see in the US-China relationship? What is their vision uh, for the United States, its place in the world and its relationship to China? And so rather than have a sort of strategic objective toward which we are organizing all of our efforts, uh, I think it's just pushback, pushback, pushback. And there's always something more that one can do. You know, as you say, there's WeChat, then there's TikTok, and there will be some other uh, new uh, platform or app uh, that is a concern to us. 
Uh, but it, 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 what we should be doing is thinking through in a strategic way, where do we want to be and how do we get there? And I think that's the biggest flaw, uh, at least in U.S.-China policy today. Well, you're channeling Henry Kissinger, who loved to say, uh, what are we trying to accomplish here? But let's just take a look at what have we accomplished uh, with the uh, trade war. Uh, when uh, Trump took office, uh, the trade deficit was around $735 billion, and now it's $854 billion. So uh, uh, is Trump right uh, uh, that uh, it's important to punish China in some way? And what does that do for the United States? He says he's for America first. Uh, I think it looks as though it's America alone. Yeah, it's not only just America alone, which would be okay if it were America alone and right, but it's just <laughs> America alone and wrong on this one. And so, uh, yeah, I think you've said it you said it all in the, the number that you, numbers that you just uh, put out there. And, you know, the economists were right. This is not the way to approach uh, uh, the concern uh, over, uh, you know, the U.S.'s relative share or, you know, sort of our desire to be able to export more uh, to China. Uh, that should be addressed through, you know, sort of fundamental, uh, you know, regulations and, and laws and, and agreements with China that, make China have an even playing field, uh, even if somehow the president had man magically managed to redress the bilateral trade deficit for two years through all of these new purchases, what did he expect was going to happen after that? All of the same issues were still there. Is it true, as he says, that we were losing jobs to China, American jobs, and uh, American companies were, uh, were moving to China? Uh, particularly in the auto industry? Well, I mean, certainly it's true. We, we've lost jobs, you know, to countries all over the world. It's part of uh, the way, it, it, it's kind of the bargain that we made when we decided that globalization uh, was, you know, a world in which we wanted to live, a globalized world. Uh, and But what we should have been doing as sort of low-cost, low-end manufacturing jobs were moving outside the country is figuring out how to uh, train and, and develop new skills for more advanced manufacturing in our country, yeah. right? And, and I mean, these are things we know that we should be doing and we simply haven't done them. And the answer is not really to try to bring back, you know, jobs and, and coal mining jobs. The answer is, you know, to move forward with, for example, new energy technologies, right? And to develop the skills in our workforce to be able to do that, because that is not only the future for the United States, it's the future for the world. And why don't we want to be uh, at the leading edge of that technology revolution? Uh, so I think, you know, a major flaw in President Trump's approach was, you know, a backward look uh, and not a, a forward look, again, for where the United States wants to be in the future, not trying to uh, recreate an America of the past. Did Trump get any of it right in your judgment? I think, um, to my mind, what the administration got right, and I, I don't really give credit to President Trump for this, because President Trump really had only two priorities in the relationship with China. One was redressing the bilateral trade deficit and dealing with North Korea. And the dealing with North Korea, of course, was important, uh, but that didn't happen, actually. So in the end, right, uh, we've made no progress with North Korea. Uh, everything else that I think this administration has gotten right, for example, uh, rebooting the Quad, right, the partnership with India and Australia and Japan, uh, strengthening partnerships with other countries in Asia, for example, you know, Vietnam, um, all of that has come out of other members of the Trump administration, uh, our pushback on China and human rights, all of these things in Xinjiang. I think the administration has done a good job of stepping up to the plate and in some cases leading even globally. You know, on the issue of Huawei, I think it's fair to say that countries in Europe and elsewhere, Japan and Australia excluded from this, uh, would not have uh, sort of looked at Huawei uh, with the same, through the same national security lens as they have now, with the same level of concern as they have now, had it not been for the Trump administration, you know, sounding the alarm. So I give the Trump administration, the people, you know, the Asia hands in the National Security Council and the State Department credit 
uh, for recognizing these challenges and developing policies uh, to deal with some of them. But it's not the president. You don't hear the president out there talking about a free and open Indo-Pacific. There's nothing about the United States leading on the global stage. All the elements of leadership that the United States has managed to eke out over the past three years have come because of other officials in his administration. Well, um, how long is all this going to last? Uh, Jack Ma, the, the billionaire who uh, came from nothing and founded Alibaba, says it's going to last 20 years. Is that a fair estimate? Yeah, I'm a little bit more optimistic um, that the trade war does not have to last um, 20 years. I think uh, that there's the possibility with the new administration in the United States, uh, with partnership with uh, European Union and our Asian allies, uh, and with some degree of interest among economic reformers in China, uh, that we can begin to make some progress. It's not looking good right now. I think that's true. And the overall direction in which Xi Jinping is moving the country uh, is not the right one. And his whole new dual circulation theory, which he's now put forward, is all about basically developing a closed loop of, of manufacturing, uh, investment, and uh, you know, the domestic economy will become basically 80% uh, self-sufficient. Uh, so I think that's not a good sign. But I do think if we can create an external environment uh, through trade agreements, bilateral investment treaties, other things uh, that incentivizes China to rejoin uh, the world economy on terms that are fair, uh, that that's the way to go. Um, but that requires a very different uh, administration in, in the White House. Uh, barring that, Jack Ma is probably right. <laughs> We really haven't deterred them from their human rights violations. Uh, no matter what we've done, there's a, a, we almost signaled that it was all right for them to uh, incarcerate uh, the Muslim sect, the Uyghurs in, uh, in the concentration camp, uh, the, uh, uh, the move on, uh, on the publisher, uh, Gung Shonan, who supported uh, the constitutional law professor who uh, was uh, protesting against uh, the government. Uh, I mean, there are all these, in the, and also the intercepting the people who tried to escape to Taiwan from Hong Kong uh, on a boat. Uh, and I guess they're still in jail. Uh, the, uh, uh, so the political crimes persist and uh, we haven't really done much about uh, registering any sort of protest. Well, here again, I would say that um, the administration, President Trump, no. Uh, and I think a couple of books that have come out recently have made it clear that he has no interest in, in human rights. Uh, but if you look again at uh, the National Security Council, the people there, the people at the State Department, they actually take these issues very, very seriously. And um, so we have been at the forefront, the United States and Congress, I would say, which traditionally has played a very strong role uh, in the human rights area uh, with regard to China. Uh, you know, we passed the, the Hong Kong uh, Human Rights and Democracy Act in Congress. Uh, we put sanctions on Hong Kong officials, on Xinjiang and other Chinese officials. We, you know, pushed to have American corporations, you know, ensure that they're not uh, sourcing from Xinjiang. So we have tried, I think. Um, but the, the, the problem is that in the end, these are just after the fact sticks. Uh, and they don't have an impact, I think is what you're saying and, and right, uh, rightly saying, they don't actually have an impact in changing Chinese behavior. Also, what do you make of uh, Trump's business dealings in China? He uh, uh, paid uh, 250 times as much in taxes to China, uh, it was reported, than he uh, paid to uh, the Internal Revenue Service. You know, Jim, I, I don't think there are words that could express what I happen to think about that. No words to express it. So anyway, let me ask you a question, Liz. Where do you see the U.S.-China relationship going um, over the next decade? I think it's going to be challenging um, no matter who is in the White House. I do think if we end up with the Biden uh, administration, uh, you know, beginning in, in 2021, uh, that at the very least, I think two really important things will happen. Number one, I think the United States will begin to recapture, to reclaim uh, some of its leadership uh, on the global stage in terms of addressing global challenges, things like the pandemic or global climate change, refugees, 
uh, all of those issues where the rest of the world, you know, looked to the U.S. for leadership, admired the United States for uh, its leadership. I think a Biden administration will, uh, you know, begin uh, to move back into that direction. And I think that's hugely important. And it's hugely important in dealing with China because we left a vacuum uh, of leadership. China could have filled it. It's only by the grace of God that Xi Jinping <laughs> doesn't, doesn't actually uh, have the wherewithal to, to do the right thing on the global stage in many respects. So China couldn't fill it, um, but we need to be back in action. The other thing I think that's important that will happen is that uh, we will reconstitute some form of a bilateral framework with China. Um, we will, I think, try to find a few areas of common ground and common purpose. Uh, and so in that way, put a floor uh, underneath, you know, this relationship, which seems to be spiraling down. Uh, and of course, my big hope is that we will, in the end, have a strategy for China, uh, not just something where we just keep pushing back without a sense of where uh, we want to see this relationship end up. Spiraling down, but all is not lost if we can possibly evolve a strategy. Liz, this has been just marvelous, a terrific, terrific exchange. And uh, I want to thank you for coming by. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. I'm Jim Zirin. Stay well, be safe, and all the best.